So yet again, a uh, special welcome to Jesse Peterson, who will give us his first lecture now on semi-finite von Neumann algebras. All right. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Uh, and I'd also like to thank all of the organizers, uh, especially because I know it's uh, very difficult to put on a conference uh, under these particular circumstances. Uh, so I definitely applaud their effort. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? There's no issues there? Okay, good. Uh, so uh, yeah, I just wanted to give uh, some lectures on, on some uh, concepts in von Neumann algebras and specifically how they, uh, their connections to some certain concepts in group theories uh, that have been developing in the last uh, 10 or, or 15 years or so. Uh, and so I thought I'd begin the lecture series by focusing on uh, just von Neumann algebras, the basics. So this is YM C star A. So I assume that uh, everybody's familiar with some basics of operator algebras. Uh, but I won't assume everybody's familiar with all the basics of von Neumann algebras. Uh, so this lecture will be uh, kind of presenting some of these uh, basic concepts. And uh, if you have been familiar with von Neumann algebras, some of this might uh, be very familiar to you. Uh, so let me just start with a definition. Uh, so we recall that a von Neumann algebra uh, is a C star subalgebra. Uh, let's give it a name M of bounded operators on H, a very nice C star algebra. Uh, but it's a C star subalgebra with an extra condition. Uh, so, such that uh, first of all, we require that the unit is contained in M. So, one, I'll just denote the unit, uh, the identity on, on H as one. One is contained in M. Uh, and uh, we'll want that one of the three equivalent conditions hold. Uh, M is closed in the weak operator topology, which I'll remind you that this is the topology where you have a net of vector or a net of operators. a net of operators will converge to an operator here, uh, if and only if, whenever you apply them to a vector and take the inner product with another vector, I put the I in the wrong spot, then these inner products should converge to the corresponding inner product. So that's the weak operator topology. Uh, the second equivalent condition is that M is closed in the strong operator topology, which a net of operators converges there, if and only if, when you apply each uh, ti to a vector, then the vectors converge. And this is convergence and norm here, not weak convergence. And the third condition is that uh, m is equal to its own uh, double commutant. So this is a purely algebraic condition where I'll remind you that if you have a set S, then the commutant of the set S is by definition, the set of operators that commute with everything in S. So this is set of S and B of H such that uh, S T is equal to T S for all T and S. And so clearly, M is always contained in this double commutant. When you have equality, it's equivalent to these top two. Uh, so the fact that these three conditions are equivalent is a classic result of von Neumann. Um, and uh, to see that the first two are equivalent is not so difficult because you just check that um, uh, you know M is a con M, it's a C star algebra. So in particular, M is a convex set. And being closed in the weak operator topology is the same as being closed in the strong operator topology because you can show that with respect to both of these topologies, you have the same continuous linear functions. And so then we know that by the Han Bonnach separation theorem, convex uh, closed sets coincide. Uh, so that's not too difficult to see. Uh, to see that they're equivalent to the third one, one direction is easy, uh, and that is that. Uh, so certainly 
the strong operator topologies contained in the uh, bicommutant. So the fact that if you take the closure that this is contained in the bicommutant, uh, this is an, an easy exercise. If you haven't seen this before, everyone here should be able to sit down with just the definition uh, definitions I've given you and, and prove this. Uh, the other inclusion that in general for a C star subalgebra, uh, you have that the double commutant is contained in the strong operator topology closure. Uh, this is a clever trick by von Neumann, um, which uh, goes as follows. So if, so here's a sketch of a proof. Uh, so proof. And that is that if you have, um, say, T in the double commutant, uh, so then we want to approximate this by things in M in the strong operator topology. And how do we do that? Let's, so let's fix a vector C and H. So fix C and H. And then uh, what do we notice? And here's von Neumann's observation that if you look at the set M times C and you take the closure of the set in the Hilbert space, uh, then the projection onto this uh, is in the commutant. So the projection onto this subspace, let me call this P, lives in the commutant of M. Uh, so that follows from the fact that it's a C star subalgebra, not just an algebra. That's just a remark. Uh, then once you know that, in particular, this P commutes with T. So the fact that T and P commute. So this implies in particular that if you take T and apply it to C, well, C is contained in this subspace. So therefore, this is also contained in the subspace. So this is some limit along some netter sequence of some x i c where x i are an m by definition of this subspace. Well, what have we seen then? We've seen that therefore we can approximate uh, at least t times c by some x i's times m. So for a single vector, at least we can approximate it. And then for getting multiple vectors at the same time, you use a matrix trick. Um, so that is that if you have now C1 through Xn and H, uh, then you consider this operator T, T down the diagonals, and then times the vector uh, C, C1, C2, Cn. And this vector right here, you do have as an element in H direct sum n times. And there you can compute the commutant. You still have the same natural double commutant. And so you can, again, produce a sequence of Xi's such that this vector converges to the other one. And so this gives Xi and M such that T minus Xi now times any of these Cj's goes to zero as I goes to infinity. And so then that gives you an approximation for any finite collection, which is exactly the strong operator topology. Uh, so that, there's uh, von Neu a sketch of von Neumann's proof. This is a very classical result and it's a very beautiful proof. Uh, so that's a von Neumann algebra. Let me give you some examples. So the easiest, most obvious example is if you take M to be B of H itself. So clearly that's closed in the strong operator topology. It's everything. So that's definitely a von Neumann algebra. Uh, a more interesting example is if you take uh, X mu, a sigma finite measure space. And then you can view L infinity of X mu as sitting inside of bounded operators on L2 of X mu. 
by just pointwise multiplication. So what I mean by this is I'll view if, if I have some, really this is an injection and the map is described explicitly by a function f gets sent to the multiplication operator uh, mf, which is defined by mf g is equal to just f times g. So it's just pointwise multiplication. Well, in this situation, when we think of L infinity as sitting inside of bounded operators, then it's a good exercise to show that what is the commutant of L infinity inside B of H, and you can compute directly this is equal to L infinity itself. So in this case, uh, the commutant equals L infinity. So in particular, the, the bicommutant also equals L infinity. So therefore it's a von Neumann algebra. So therefore. All right, so that's another uh, classic example of a von Neumann algebra. Here is another more interesting example. So if you have gamma, a discrete group, uh, so we have the left regular representation. This maps gamma to unitary operators on L2 of gamma. And this is given by, uh, if you think of, um, well, you just extend multiplication on the group. So, the left regular representation applied to S times the Dirac function at T should be the Dirac function at ST. And then you extend this formula linearly. And this gives a, a, a natural unitary representation of the group. And you have the group von Neumann algebra. So in particular, by taking linear spans, this gives you a, a representation of the group algebra. So we can think of the group algebra as sitting inside of bounded operators on L2 of gamma. The group algebra is just the span of the group together with the multiplication given by the group. Uh, so this is a star algebra that sits inside here. And so you can consider the uh, C star algebra, which is the C star algebra generated by this. And that's the uh, reduced C star algebra. So this is by definition the uh, C star closure in this uh, setting or the, the uniform closure. Uh, but then you could also consider the strong operator closure and that gives you a natural von Neumann algebra, which we call the group von Neumann algebra. So this is the strong operator topology closure. Uh, so both of these are highly studied objects and uh, probably many of you are familiar with most of them. Uh, so let me give you one more example, which combines the previous two examples. And that is now let's suppose that gamma is still a discrete group. And let's suppose that now we have, uh, again, a sigma finite measure space. And now let's suppose that we have an action of this group on this measure space by measure preserving transformations. Uh, so then what can, you, what can you do here? Well, you can kind of mimic the previous construction where rather than considering uh, where you replace the scalars uh, by L infinity functions. So specifically, you can consider uh, for simplicity, let me denote L infinity by A. So this is L infinity of X mu. This is a natural abelian von Neumann algebra. And then we can define uh, the group algebra A gamma as following. Uh, so this is going to be uh, the span. So the finite sums of things of the form AT. And then we'll have T, but uh, distinguish it from the group itself, I'll, I'll write UT for the elements of the group. 
So U here is just a, a formal letter to distinguish so that we're thinking of the it as a an element of the algebra rather than as an element of the group. Uh, and so this should be such that the sum is finite, so finite sums. And we have the AT is an L infinity, so it's an A. So you take the 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 sum of these sums, these finite sums, and this also forms uh, a, an algebra, a star algebra, in fact, a unital star algebra, where you can define multiplication You define it like you would in the group algebra. So you just kind of multiply group elements, except you also want to incorporate the action of the group on the measure space. So S gamma. So if you have two finite sums like this, then their product uh, is just going to be the sum over S and T. And you put a T here. And then you think of the, the T here acting on uh, the element here in L infinity. And so that gives you an action of the group. So you're gonna get sigma T, B S, and then U, T, S. And this is where sigma T, so this is the natural automorphism associated with the action. So whenever you have an action, you also get an, an action on L infinity uh, and it's given by Sigma T of F is just F composed T inverse. The inverse is there to make sure it's associated with this action. Uh, so this gives you a natural uh, algebra structure. You also have an adjoint. Which again here, you can kind of work it out on your own if you've never seen this before. If it's an adjoint, this should be the same as U T, and we want U to be a unitary representation, so it should be U T inverse, and then A T star here, where the star is the usual adjoint, which is complex conjugation. So maybe I'll write a bar there to make it more explicit. And now, of course, we always put the U's on the right, so now we rewrite this using the product formula up here that we have, so this is T in gamma, and now this is sigma T inverse, A T bar, and then U T inverse. And now it's again a finite sum of that formula. Uh, so you can just check very easily that this is a star algebra and that uh, the identity element of the group uh, where A E is equal to one gives you an identity for this. So this is a star algebra, it generalizes this group algebra construction over here. And the group algebra we could view inside of bounded operators on L2, and we can do something similar with this uh, twisted uh, algebra. So specifically, we can view this A gamma as sitting inside of bounded operators on L2 of X mu, tensor, uh, L2 of gamma, which here you can also think of these as sums of elements of L2, tensor elements of L2 gamma or, or summed by the group. Uh, so you can extend this product formula here. Maybe I'll copy it over to the next page. So this formula, which I gave before uh, for multiplication, as this is sum of S and T gamma A T sigma T S U T S. So this makes perfect sense uh, also when this second term is contained in this Hilbert space. And this formula also makes uh, perfect sense. And this gives you a representation of this uh, unital star algebra on this Hilbert space. So whenever you have a representation on the Hilbert space, you can define the von Neumann algebra it generates, and that's the crossed product of von Neumann algebra. So this is defined to be the 
strong operator topology closure of this algebra, which sits inside of this bounded operator on this open space. So this is, uh, and this is called the group measure space construction. And this is due to Marian von Neumann. Uh, so one remark I should make at this point is that uh, the group measure space construction can also be done. So I assume that it was a measure preserving transformation. Uh, and this can also be done in general if you just have a transformation which just preserves the measure class. Uh, so this is just a remark. So this can be done if the action uh, preserves uh, null sets. So if it preserves null sets, uh, and this is uh, assuming it's a yeah, sigma finite. Uh, so if it preserves null sets, then in particular, you have the Radon nicotine derivative associated with this uh, transformation and you can incorporate that in this formula up here, and then that can give you a unitary representation there and you can do it. However, I, in my lectures, I'm only gonna be focusing on the measure preserving case. And the reason for that is that there you have an, a nice uh, fact that the associated cross product you get um, is uh, at, at least semi finite And I'll define exactly what I mean by that in just a moment. Uh, so first, a few remarks about these constructions. Uh, so the first is this is a result of Murray and von Neumann. Well, all of, all of this so far has been Murray and von Neumann or, or von Neumann himself. And that is that you can uh, immediately calculate the center of the group von Neumann algebra, or at least you can show its uh, trivial, meaning it's scalar multiples of the identity. Uh, this is if and only if um, uh, gamma has infinite uh, non-trivial conjugacy classes, which we'll denote by ICC. So if you have a group and every non-trivial conjugacy class is infinite, then the center of this group von Neumann algebra is uh, the scalars. So this, i.e. L gamma is a factor. The von Neumann algebra is a factor if it has trivial center. And conversely, if you have trivial center, then that ensures that the group has, uh, is ICC. Uh, for the group measure space construction, there's not quite a nice if and only if, but at least under certain mild hypotheses there are. So that is that if we have here, again, a measure preserving action and my measure spaces will always be sigma finite or finite. Um, uh, if you have a measure preserving action uh, and if this uh, is free and free. So maybe I should mean essentially. So what does that mean? That just means that the stabilizer subgroups uh, should be the trivial group, at least for almost every x and x. Uh, so that's the definition of freeness. Uh, maybe I'm being slightly sloppy here in, the, in that uh, this might assume your group is countable to define freeness this way. Uh, but I'm fine assuming my groups are countable throughout my lecture series. So I won't worry about that. Uh, so this is uh, freeness. And if you assume the action is free, uh, so then you get that the cross product construction uh, is a factor if and only if the action is ergodic. And what ergodic means is that there are no 
uh, globally invariant sets, except for possibly null sets or conal sets. Uh, so I mean, if you have measurable, there's that. S E is equal E for all S and gamma. So then the measure of E is equal to zero or the measure of the complement is equal to zero. So that's ergodicity. Uh, and then if you have a free action, then the, the cross product's a factor if and only if it's ergodic. Uh, so both of these are classic results of Maria von Neumann, but I think I'll skip the proofs uh, they're particularly difficult, but uh, I want to speed up for time. Uh, okay, so like I said, uh, these constructions in the measure preserving case have the extra nice property that they give you semi-finite von Neumann algebras. Uh, and specifically, they give you traces. And I want to review some basic fact about traces on von Neumann algebras. Uh, so the first is, so here we have M a von Neumann algebra. So a normal faithful uh, semi-finite trace on M is a function, which I'll denote by TR. And this maps the positive operators from M into zero to infinity, uh, such that it satisfies the following properties. Uh, so one, uh, you want that it preserves the cone structure so that the trace of say alpha uh, X plus beta Y is alpha trace of X plus beta trace of y, and this is for alpha, beta uh, greater than or equal to zero and x and y uh, in the positive cone. Uh, two, I want that the trace is uh, continuous in some natural topology, and that's where the normal comes from. Uh, so specifically, I want that uh, if uh, xi is increasing, and converges uh, in the strong operator topology to X. So this is all in M. So then I'll want that the trace of XI should converge to the trace of X. So there's this continuity. So that's normality. Uh, three, I want that uh, it's faithful so that the trace of X equals zero, uh, if and only if uh, X itself is equal to zero. Uh, four, I want semi-finiteness. So that means that uh, if we have X in the positive cone X not equal to zero, well then, at least there's something under X which has finite trace. So X could have infinite trace, but uh, we want that there exists some Y less than or equal to X such that the trace of Y is uh, between zero and infinity. Otherwise we could just define every non-zero element to be infinity and that would be a, a not very good trace. Uh, so that's the semi-finiteness that ensures that we have a reasonable condition. And then of course the uh, tracial property, which just says the trace of X star X should always be the trace of X X star. All right, so these are the conditions uh, on a normal faithful semi-finite trace. And uh, throughout my lecture series, I, I'm all, only gonna be focused on von Neumann algebras, which have one of these. Um, and so in fact, I'll, I'll usually fix a, a trace throughout my, my lecture series. Uh, so some basic facts. First, let me give you uh, two uh, definitions. So we'll denote by N sub TR. This is going to be the set of elements in X such that the trace of X star X 
is finite. And I'll denote MTR. This is going to be the set of finite sums, uh, XI star YI, such that uh, XI and YI are both in this and so TR right here. Uh, and then there's a lemma you can do, which again, I'm gonna skip for the sake of time. And that is that both of these are ideals. Ideals. So they won't be closed ideals, of course, but they will be algebraically two-sided ideals. Um, uh, yeah, so that's a lemma, which is a non-trivial lemma because uh, even showing that these uh, spaces that I've defined are even vector spaces is non-trivial. Uh, but it's not, uh, but it's kind of standard stuff. And for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip the proofs here. Uh, but let me give you some examples. And once you see the examples, it'll kind of give you most of the intuition that you need. Uh, so the first example is if M is equal to L infinity of X mu, and this is a semi-finite measure space. And then we can define a trace by the trace of a function is just the integral of the function with respect to D. D. <clears throat> and then you just uh, think to yourself, you should be able to verify all five of these uh, conditions fairly easily. Uh, so this is a, a canonical example of a trace. The other kind of canonical example is that if you have M to be bounded operators on a Hilbert space, uh, so then you can define the trace as the usual trace of matrices. So if you have say CI and orthonormal basis for the Hilbert space, uh, so then we define a trace of an operator T, a positive operator, as the sum over all i of the inner product of t ci ci. So you think matrices, if you have your ci the standard basic vector, then this is just summing the diagonal, which is the, the usual trace you've seen for matrices. Uh, so this is a natural trace, and this gives it to you. Uh, oh, what are these nm and mm? I should mention that. Let me make a little more room here. So here you can compute this, this ideal N here uh, rather directly. And this is going to be exactly uh, the subspace of L infinity, which is also uh, in L2, two of X mu. And this M, this is the subspace of L infinity, which is also in L1. So these are easy enough to compute. And down here in the B of H example, we also have N sub T R. So this is usually uh, called something else. This is the space of Hilbert Schmidt operators. This is space. And you have M sub T R. This is the trace class operators. All right. Uh, so in particular, in both of these examples, you can verify directly, and this is a general fact, that the trace, which is only defined on positive operators, extends linearly to this ideal. Uh, so that's another fact that I'm going to use. So lemma or fact. And that is the trace has a unique linear extension, which I'll again denote by TR. And this is mapping this to now the complex numbers. Now these are all finite valued by definition of this uh, trace ideal. Uh, the positive operators have finite trace. So these will be finite value. Uh, 
Okay, and then the other thing that I want to mention, uh, yeah, so the other thing is also, if you notice this definition of, uh, so that's, oh, did I write uh, M, MT? Sorry about that. This should be M, the trace ideal. And N is like the Hilbert Schmidt operators or L2 of the group. So that's like a Hilbert space. So the other lemma or the other remark actually follows directly from this lemma. So the remark is that uh, the trace gives an inner product on this ideal n sub tr, and this is given by, uh, say, xy respect to the trace is equal to the trace of y star x, which is well defined uh, because we know that if uh, x and y are in n, then y star x is in m. That's, that was how we defined m. Uh, so this gives a well-defined inner product here, and hence we can complete this complete this to a Hilbert space, uh, which we will denote by L2 of M TR. So this is the completion of M TR with respect to this inner product. Uh, another example, which I'll uh, mention, is that uh, so if uh, the trace of one is finite. So then trace is called a finite trace, it's a finite trace. Uh, in which case, of course, you have the MTR, same as NTR, which is the same as M in this case. So a lot of uh, the, these lemmas become trivial in this situation. That's a remark. Uh, so then I also want to mention the standard representation, which is that once you have L2 of M, you naturally get an inclusion from M into bounded operators on L2 of M. And this is just by left multiplication. Uh, so uh, these, I already mentioned they're their ideals, and so left multiplication makes sense and gives you a, a natural embedding of M into B of L2 of M. So this is given by, say, um, X times A. Maybe I'll put a little A hat to think of hat. Uh, I should remark that, so we'll write A hat for A in, well, it's for A in, this ideal, but when we think of it inside of the completion. So when we think of A as an element of L2, we want to distinguish it from A as an element of M. So I'll put a little hat over it. This just simplifies, uh, makes it slightly less confusing. Uh, and then we define this by just left multiplication, and then we put a hat there. So that gives a natural representation of M. This is a normal representation since the trace is normal. And this is called the standard representation. So, we also have a representation of the opposite algebra. So, this also naturally acts on L2. And this is by uh, right, uh, right multiplication. So here we have um, x op times a hat is going to be a x hat in this way. Uh, and in this, from this formula, you see directly that this, the m opposite, well, you can also verify that this gives you a von Neumann algebra here. The opposite algebra is a von Neumann algebra and that this will commute with the action of M because M is acting by left multiplication, the opposite algebra is acting by right multiplication. And so those, these will indeed be commute with each other. And in fact, uh, you can prove a nice theorem. That is that uh, the M op is exactly equal to the commutant 
of M in the standard representation. Uh, let's see, I was going to prove this because it's a nice little proof, but I think I'm going to skip the proof uh, based on time. I only have 20 minutes left. All right. Uh, so this is this is a nice fact, though, and it's a fun fun thing to prove. It's it's a non non trivial thing, but it's it's kind of nice. Um, but it it generalizes the example we saw before. So recall that when we saw that L infinity of x mu was equal to its own commutant. So this is a generalization of that fact. Uh, to the non-commutative setting, that the commutants is equal to the opposite algebra in the standard representation. Of course, when you're abelian, the opposite algebra multiplication on left and right doesn't doesn't make any difference. All right. Um, so the general. Oh, I should also give two more examples of traces. These are the main von Neumann algebras I'm interested in. And that is that if gamma is discrete group, so then there's a natural trace on L gamma. This will be a finite trace. And this is given by the trace of an operator X here is given by this vector space. Remember, L gamma lives inside of B of L2 gamma. And so this is given by multiply by the Dirac function at the identity. We'll take the inner product with the Dirac function at the identity. So this is certainly a state on L gamma. Uh, and it's not so difficult to see that this is, uh, well, it's clearly a normal state by definition. Uh, and it's not so difficult to see that this is faithful. Uh, for the tracial property, I'll just remark that it's because it's normal, it's enough to do the trace on a dense subalgebra. Uh, to verify the tracial condition on dense subalgebra, like the group algebra itself. And then also by taking linear spans, it's enough to verify the trace condition on just group elements. Uh, so let me go ahead and verify the trace condition on group elements. So you have you have the trace of lambda s times lambda t. Well, what is this? This is lambda s lambda t times direct function at the identity times direct function at the identity. So this is just, uh, we see that this is zero if S is not equal to T inverse. And if S is equal to T inverse, it's equal to one. Uh, but now if you think of what is the trace of lambda T lambda S, well, you just reverse the roles of uh, S and T, and you get exactly the same thing, right? And then extending on the span, you can take spans of S, spans and T, and you get it on the group algebra. And then, uh, and then, like I said, since it's a vector state, it's clearly continuous in the strong operator topology. And so then you get it for all of them to the von Neumann algebra. Uh, the other example is that if you have here an action of gamma, and this time I'm going to assume that it's not a, sim a sigma finite measure space, but rather a finite measure space. So this is a probability measure preserving. Uh, so in this case, uh, you get a natural, again, linear functional here. Again, this will be a finite trace, and this is given by the trace of x. It will again be given by a vector state. Now, here the state I'm going to consider. So remember, this lives inside of bounded operators on L2 of x tensor L2 of gamma. And so I'm just going to take the constant 1 function, and then I'm going to tensor it with the Dirac function at the identity. And take the vector state corresponding to that. And then again, for almost the same sort of calculation, just slightly more tricky now where you have to use measure preserving, uh, 
uh, you can verify that this is indeed a, a trace. And again, you just have to verify it on kind of basic elements to, and then use normality to verify this. So I won't, I won't do any more there. All right, so both of these have uh, finite traces, so they're finite von Neumann algebras. So an algebra is finite. This is if and only if there exists a normal, faithful, uh, finite trace. And semi-finite, same thing here, but now semi-finite. All right, so uh, my von Neumann algebras will usually be acting on separable Hilbert space, so you can take this as a definition uh, of a finite or semi-finite von Neumann algebra. And like I said, uh, my von Neumann algebras will usually have some sort of God-given trace like we have in these two examples, uh, so you always have some some trace floating around. Uh, I should also mention that if the von Neumann algebra is a factor and it has a trace or a semi-finite trace, then it's the unique trace or semi-finite trace up to scalar multiplication. That's the result of von Murray and von Neumann. All right, so now let me tell you the general problem that we're interested in in uh, von Neumann algebras, uh, and specifically group or group measure space von Neumann algebras, and that is how much information from gamma or from the action, if we have an action, uh, is encoded in the group von Neumann algebra, or if we have an action, the uh, cross product. So this is a general uh, problem uh, that has been studied quite a bit over the last, uh, especially 50 years or so. Uh, and there's been striking results kind of in, in both directions, situations where you remember almost nothing uh, so there you have a result of Kahn that, for instance, says that uh, the von Neumann algebra sees very little of amenability, or basically only sees amenability. Uh, I'll, mention, I'll do results like that in a moment. And then you have the complete other extreme, uh, first shown by Ioana Popa and Voss, where you have examples of groups that the group von Neumann algebra uh, completely remembers the group. So in other words, that there is no other group which gives you the same von Neumann algebra. And, uh, and there's been a lot of research done on this in the last 10 or 15 years. And I, and I believe there are some talks even at this conference about uh, additional examples of, of that. Uh, so let me give you one uh, basic example of this. So maybe the first type of, uh, of result where you see sort of the group and the von Neumann algebra interacting. And that's this theorem. Uh, maybe I'll go to the next page so I can fit the whole proof in here. So here's the theorem. So suppose uh, gamma and lambda are ICC and their von Neumann algebras are isomorphic. Uh, so then gamma is amenable if and only if lambda is amenable. So at least the notion of amenability uh, is preserved under uh, this construction. So let me remind you, if you haven't seen this before, uh, yeah, Daniel Drimbe, I think he will talk about super rigidity. Uh, so let me remind you, so if you haven't seen amenability before, uh, here's the definition, and this is all that I'll use. Uh, so gamma is amenable if there exists a left invariant state on L infinity of gamma. 
so L infinity of gamma is naturally a C star algebra. It's a von Neumann algebra, as we've already seen. You can think about it as just a discrete measure space. Uh, and the group acts on gamma, uh, acts on itself by left multiplication. And so this gives you an action on L infinity, as I've already described to you. Uh, and you can just ask, is there a state uh, which is invariant under this left action? And that's the definition of amenability. This was defined by von Neumann um, and has been a very powerful notion. Uh, there are about 100 or so different characterizations of amenability, but I'm just going to stick with this original definition of von Neumann algebra to prove this theory. All right, so let's go ahead and give a proof of this. Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and suppose, suppose gamma is amenable and uh, fix the state, uh, say phi, uh, that is left invariant. All right, uh, so uh, now that we have this, the, the, the key idea here is that we're going to first extend this state from L infinity all the way up to B of L2, which is good for us because that's where the group von Neumann algebra lives. Uh, and we're going to do that by noticing, so we'll define V tilde. So this is going to map B of L2. So it's going to be an extension of V when we think of L infinity as acting diagonally, but we don't want to take any extension using von Banach. We'll take a specific extension. In this case, we can. So we'll define V tilde. And this is by V tilde of an operator T is phi composed with this uh, conditional expectation where this conditional expectation from L2 of gamma to L infinity of gamma is defined by Conditional expectation of T. Uh, so this should give us something in L infinity. So I'll tell you what it is at an element S. And this is just going to be T times the vector direct function of S, inner product of the vector direct function of S. Uh, so we take all these vector states, uh, if one for each element of the group, and we combine them. And that gives us a map from B of L2 to L infinity. Uh, and this is a, a well-defined linear map. And so then we take the composition. And then the thing to notice is of course here, if T is positive, so note, if T is positive, well then all of these states give positive values. So this implies in particular that uh, this expectation on the T is positive. Uh, but therefore, when we apply our state here, it implies that we get something positive. So that implies that V tilde of T is positive. And clearly the identity gives you the identity. So this is indeed a state. So it gives us a state on B of L2. Uh, the other thing to note is that if we have X and L gamma, so then let's go ahead and compute what this expectation is. The expectation of X and S. So this is X and then direct function of S, direct function of S, which we can rewrite as X and then left, left regular representation. And here we also have the left regular representation, which is of course the trace of lambda S star X lambda S by how we define the trace. Uh, but now we use the tracial property and see that this is the trace of X, which we can rewrite as, um, well, that's all I want to say. So in this case, you can actually, it's independent of X. So in that, this case, this maps to a scalar and the scalar is exactly the trace of X. So in particular, therefore, we get that phi tilde of X is equal to the trace of X. So this V tilde that we've defined in this way extend it restricts to the trace on the group von Neumann algebra, which is a useful fact. 
why is this useful? The other fact I want to re remark, so note is that if you look at the expectation of uh, some operator T, and if we conjugate by element of the left regular representation, say lambda T, lambda T inverse. And now let's look at what this is at say uh, S. Well, you can again compute what this is. So this is uh, lambda T, T inverse delta S delta S, which we see is the expectation of T. And then when you apply this, you get a T inverse. So this is at T inverse S, which if you like, this is just left, the corresponding left translation action of the expectation. So the conditional expectation behaves well with respect to con the conjugation action on the inside and the action by left multiplication on the outside. And this is good because phi we know is invariant under left multiplication. Uh, and so we can therefore see that phi tilde of lambda t, t, lambda t inverse uh, is equal to uh, well, using left invariance, we see this is phi tilde of t. Uh, so that this state on B of L2 isn't very under conjugation. In particular, what, what does this mean? So this means that uh, since this is true for all t, we get that phi tilde of lambda t t is equal to phi tilde of lambda t t and the t and t inverse, which is phi tilde t and t. So we get this formula for all t in the group and t in lambda. And now this formula is better than the one before it because we can take spans in the group elements. And so we get therefore phi tilde of xt is equal to phi tilde of tx or t and b of L2. And for x in the group up. But now using the fact that phi tilde restricts to the trace, we can use a trick by con and just notice that phi tilde of xt in absolute value, we can use Cauchy-Schwartz to say that this is less than or equal to phi tilde of uh, x x star one half times phi tilde of t star t one half. So that's Cauchy-Schwartz, which is valid for any state. Uh, but then here we notice that this is the trace, uh, which can be approximated. So if, if we want to, um, yeah, so this is the trace, which will be very small if x is close to zero in, in the uh, strong operator topology. Uh, so what this means is that this formula here, which was valid only for group elements, for elements in the group algebra, Actually, you can extend it both by approximating x on the left or on the right to elements of the group von Neumann algebra. So the consequence, I was hoping to keep this on one page, but I guess I won't. So the consequence is that therefore phi tilde of xt is equal to phi tilde of tx, and this is for t and v of L2. This is for x now in L gamma. And by hypothesis, we're assuming that L gamma and L lambda are isomorphic. So this is for L lambda. And so now the final step is to go back to L lambda. So now we define, so recall that since they're ICC, they have the same trace. So we can identify not just L gamma and L lambda, but we can also identify B of L2 of gamma with B of L2 of lambda. And so now we define this new state phi double tilde on L infinity of lambda by uh, phi double tilde of some function f. Well, you just think of this as multiplication operator like we did before, and you apply phi tilde to it. And then the same computation we did before, uh, we see that phi tilde uh, double tilde of the left multiplication by f. This is nothing but phi tilde 
of conjugation. But now these lambdas are now in L gamma or L lambda, but L lambda is equal to L gamma. And so now we can use that formula we did before. So this is P to multiple. Okay. So this gives a left invariant uh, state now on L infinity of lambda. So we've essentially transferred it from L infinity of gamma to L infinity of lambda in this way. All right, and we'll see this uh, sort of transferring information uh, via, you know, bounded operators in L2. We'll, we'll see this crop up again in, in some of my other lectures. Uh, but I think I'll go ahead and, and stop here. Okay.